Hello, and welcome to the Sci-Fi Show. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're back for another sci-fi episode. Uh, I know we didn't stream on Tuesday, but, you know, life was busy and I was tired. <laughs> so tonight's show is uh, going to be about indoctrination. It's one of those things that's been quite common um, that you hear some of us atheists say that, that people are only religious because they've been indoctrinated. Um, yet when I was a theist, I, I don't feel like I was actually indoctrinated. So what we're going to question tonight is, you know, what actually is indoctrination? And we are going to be having a guest, Rev N. Fidel, who's uh, going to be helping us out with this one, which is absolutely awesome. We're back on the stream. We know we love him here. And Philip was going to be here, but it's actually Philip's birthday. He didn't realise it was tonight <laughs> when we were setting everything up. So he's probably otherwise uh, in, engaged with, with, with his birthday. Yeah. Um, so... Philip probably won't be joining us, though it depends on, on how his festivities go. Uh, but yeah, Rev will be here and Dave will, and we'll be discussing, you know, indoctrination, the effects of indoctrination. We'll be looking at different ways indoctrination is described in churches and schools and all that sort of thing and how it can be done. Uh, hey, Wolf, great to have you here already. Um, so tonight, no, we're not going to have a house mix to start. I think I'm going to do a glitch hop mix. Um, and yeah, I, it's been ages since I've mixed glitch hop as well. Uh, so I just figured I'd, I'd give that a bit of a, a spin. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're catching the rerun, um, I do a pre-stream mix quite often before the stream and uh, I then extract it out of the actual live broadcast and I put it into um, a, a playlist called Plato's Rave. So uh, there's usually about half an hour long mix. Today we might have about 45 minutes. Um, is there a difference between Glitch Hop and House? Yes, and you'll find out what it is. Glitch Hop's like electronic hip hop. Um, house is more 4-4 style beat and obviously drum and bass is really fast uh, drum beats and wicked bass lines and a lot of sort of sound. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, if you're here this early, I assume you're here for the mix, so it's probably time I shut the hell up and we get on with it. Okay, bye. I'm too shy to go on. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Sci-Fi Show. I'm Joe. And I'm supposed to be Dave. <laughs> and this, as you might remember, is Rev, Rev N. Fidel. How are you doing, Rev? Doing well. Thanks and, for having me on again. Oh, man, it's awesome having you on again. We love having you on. Uh, but Rev, before we, we actually get into tonight's conversation, you've got some news for us all, haven't you? Yeah, so so today um, I got up and uh, my uh, lady friend uh, said, hey, let's go get some crepes. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm down for crepes. I mean, who isn't down for crepes? And we go downtown. And um, so we stopped at this place. And it didn't look like they had any crepes in there. But I was kind of initially skeptical. And I was using my critical thinking skills, but uh, I think something was up a little bit. And um, uh, before I knew it and before my critical skill think, uh, thinking could kick in, um, I ended up getting married. <laughs> nice Yay, one. Congrats, congratulations. Mate. Well, thank you. And then we did get crates. You did. Um, <laughs> you got them. Yeah, the lemon blueberry, so which are my favorite. Yeah, it wasn't a wasted day, you know. <laughs> no. no, we peaked at, uh, my day peaked at about 1030 Eastern time here. Oh, nice. Nice one. <laughs> That's when you got the crepes, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> the culmination of the event. <laughs> <just 
Uh, awesome. Um, no, honestly, congratulations. Such uh, well, happy news you. to hear. Um, yeah, awesome. So uh, for those of you who might not know Rev, uh, we know Rev through Twitter and he responded um, to the 10 questions for atheists. And if you haven't seen any of those, I mean, definitely check them out. But Rev, just give us a quick rundown of, of, of who you are. Uh, well, I just uh, kind of jack around on Twitter a lot with the, um, the theists and the atheists and try to try to find that happy spot of getting blocked by about 30% on each side. And um, my, my background, of course, um, I, I've talked about it on a few occasions. I, I grew up um, in Christian science, which, uh, you know, is not your fundamental evangelical Christianity, but uh, uh, sort of uh, gave me a, an appreciation for um, theism, uh, let's say, without being uh, evangelical or sending people to hell or Golden Corral or anything like that. And then um, after I uh, got out of high school, uh, I worked in Christian publishing for about 15 years, but that was more about, you know, books and stuff like that rather than, you know, any sort of, um, there's just a lot of, if you're going to get into publishing, you basically got legal books, um, uh, Christian publishing, and of course, adult. So <laughs> you pick one and, and apparently uh, the adult wasn't hiring. So um, <laughs> I took my second my second choice. So it had to do more with just books and publishing and, and the digi uh, digital uh, processing of books. And again, this is all happening 25 years ago. So uh, transferring books from paper medium to digital with a brand new an internet delivery. And, um, and then after used all my accumulating skills to jack around on Twitter. <laughs> and, and why not? Are. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, Rev, would you describe yourself as an atheist? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, um, as a jackhammer atheist, because um, if we're just going to start associating random uh, adjectives in front, I'm going <laughs> to not go with agnostic or gnostic to go with jackhammer. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And and when you say atheist, what does that mean to you? Uh, what atheist, you know, and, and how what it what it means to me is what it's always meant to me is this person that believes that no gods exist, and of course that's not a, any sort of claim of knowledge because it doesn't need to be. Quite frankly, it's just where I'm at right now, given my evidence and experience, rather than um, you know a, a definitive um, statement of how I feel, you know, the universe works. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So, I mean, this that's how uh, all three of us would, would use the term, but we understand that there are people out there that might use the, the label atheist differently. And, and, and ultimately, it doesn't really matter how uh, you use the term atheist, um, as long as you're clear with how you're using it. But for, for the sake of tonight, when, when we talk about atheists, we're talking about people that believe gods don't exist. Although if we talk about the online atheist community, we might be broadening that term to those that only lack belief. Yeah, yeah. And I think we need to focus, you know, as everybody says, they're tired of talking about the definition, but we have to really get um, intellectually honest about what we believe. So, I, you know, whatever a person calls themselves, as long as they're being honest about what they believe, you know, it's, it's like you can jack around with the whole evolution is just a theory. And, and that's a lot more than just a definition of a term. You're trying to steer an idea down a bad path. And, um, and, and I believe when, I believe there's some people that are truly caught in the middle of theism and atheism, and they're rejecting both or accepting both to some degree, and they're somewhere in the middle. And that's fine, and that's where they're at, but they just need to be able to uh, portray what they believe honestly. 
Oh, you know? and, and, and if they don't want to, then and that's fine too. And just tell everyone to shut off. I think that's what you guys say, right? <laughs> and and um, you know, you, you don't owe anybody an explanation, and that's fine too. If you don't care to say or say, I, I just this is what I believe. The end. You know, I'm not going to defend it, or I don't feel like I need to um, discuss it. Then that's fine too. But just rather than you know defining what you are in anticipation of an argument just seems sort of backwards to me. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that actually is one of the things that, that comes up quite often. You, you see people using a particular label and a particular definition purely for that reason of they're, they're getting their defenses up already because they feel it makes them have a, a stronger position, um, which is kind of interesting like what why don't you try and go into a conversation as having a conversation and stop trying to defend slash win the conversation actually have a conversation and and, and see what happens um i'd just like to say right. and, and if you feel like no sorry carry on no no if if um you uh if you feel like your position is weak then take the opportunity to either abandon it or strengthen it Oh, most definitely. Rather than, you know, rather than just just uh, box it off, you know, and just say I'm untouchable, you know, I get a I get a pass here or whatever. Just say, look, I'm gonna I'm going to either strengthen my argument or I'm going to find out I need to abandon it. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's nothing wrong with someone saying they don't know or I don't have enough information or even saying. I lean this way, but I don't feel fully justified in leaning this way. These are my current reasons. These are my current doubts for this position. Like, the thing is, you, you can move forward. And sometimes someone challenging your position can actually strengthen it. You know, oh, if you're absolutely, absolutely yeah. honest, their challenges, you can go, well, you know, that's a load of crap. And that makes you feel stronger. There's nothing wrong with having these challenges. You don't need to go in with the strongest position into these things. You can go in uncertain and come out more certain. Or, you know what, as you mentioned, you might realize that actually I'm not justified in holding this position. I might need to change it. I might need to lean this way. I might need to lean that way. I might need to lean agnostic on this uh, proposition or, or whatever. It's also just good skepticism and intellectual virtue. Yeah, which there isn't enough of, especially on social media. <laughs> That's because I've stolen it all. <laughs> yeah, it's there on the shelf behind you. <laughs> it is. Also, so is. Hang on. New toy. Oh, oh, new toy. Oh. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, so I'd just like to say as well, uh, hello to Gary Brooker, who is or Gary Booker, sorry, sorry, uh, new to this show. Um, so welcome. Um, yeah, this show's a little bit weird, um, a little bit different, hopefully, from most shows that you'll you'll be watching on YouTube. We quite often start with about half hour, forty five minutes of music um whatever i'm mixing at the time um we enjoy a good conversation lots of banter hopefully get lots of questions from the chat and we discuss things and try to be as open-minded charitable and fair as possible without our brains falling out of our heads um because they've already gone uh <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i i mean the, the the chat is pretty much open to to everyone and uh you know any question we we'll, we do try and get to um sometimes the chat goes so fast that i do miss it and feel free to ask a question uh, a couple of times because you know there's there's nothing wrong with that and if you want to tag me or or Dave in um in fact tag both of us in and there's chance that at least one of us will see it and I'll chuck it up on screen and we'll put it in there um but tonight you know we, we've done our intros and uh I think that we should probably move on to tonight's topic now as you all understand we're all atheists um and two of us have been theists at some point in our life. Um, I was a typical Church of England Christian. So it's like 
Christianity light. <laughs> and uh, as Rev mentioned, he was a Christian scientist, which isn't really Christianity or science, but it, it's somewhere out there. <laughs> Um, it's really out there <laughs> it's like christianity on mushrooms basically uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have a, a sort of spectrum of uh what we used to believe and what we currently believe we currently believe all the same things and one of the things that we we tend to do when we're discussing on the internet is actually address other atheists' arguments and points. Um, for me, it's because I don't necessarily like being grouped in with other atheists that make really bad arguments and seem to have got all their learning from memes and all that sort of thing. And... To be honest, I think we atheists can do a lot better. And I know I've made some of these arguments in the past myself. And I've learned that a lot of them <laughs> I used to make were wrong. Um, I was a bit of the, the keyboard warrior type of atheist. And I look back on some of the things I used to say and go, Oh, oh really? Really? Please no one bring that up to me. But it's unfortunately still in there. I need to get enough alcohol in me so that i can forget that i've ever said these things that's why i drink you every need stream. to trust the liquor <laughs> let the liquor do your critical thinking <laughs> and um you know we've got a few series um on on our website we've got the the, the bad atheist arguments um, on uh, on our, our streams, we've got the sci-fi shorts, which often address um, a lot of bad atheist memes or comments or misunderstandings as well. I've got um, the conflated and misunderstood terms series, which addresses things that both theists and atheists and everyone else in between address on the site as well. There's lots of things that we do to try and address any form of misinformation. Now, one of the things that we haven't really ever addressed before on the stream or on the website is the topic of indoctrination. Now, it's come up a lot in conversation over the past, and it's sort of recently come up again. I don't know if you noticed this as well, guys, but uh, on, on Twitter or any other social media, it seems like arguments and memes come and go in waves. You sort of get this peak of all of these really bad arguments, and it's all this type. Everybody's sharing this thing, and, it's, and then it dies off, and you might not hear that argument for a while. And you're like, oh, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, that one's died a death. That's good. People have learned from it. But then, you know, six months later, it's come back again. And it's all the same people sharing it, but a ton of new people sharing it too. Uh, I mean, is that is that your experience? Yeah, but in the atheist community, there's only certain conversations that are ever held at the same time. They all seem to go in waves. Yeah. And unless you pick off one like the weak gazelle and start forcing them to actually discuss their arguments, all the conversations are the same. It, it's like a, a rotational thing. Uh, and what about you, Rev? Have you noticed similar sort of patterns? I feel like we have a whole generation that have been raised on me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I think you're right there. I, I think uh, memes became popular as probably as I was a teenager, I like, started to get popular. Um, so <laughs> people that were being born as I was a teenager, you're right. <laughs> they would have been raised almost completely by memes with how easy it is to get on the internet these days. Um so anyway, tonight's conversation, which we haven't got to, uh, is about indoctrination. So the question of conversation um, is, is, what is indoctrination? And how does it affect us? How does it affect other people? And, uh, and where can we see examples of indoctrination? And does it come in different levels 
or is it two different things when it's it's slightly different so should we should we start and go you know rev what is indoctrination yeah i to be honest that's i don't know but i know what it isn't is uh people like learning things in school or from their parents or in sunday school you know that's just learn and some of it's good some of it's bad um i think uh this idea that um everything is being you know it, you know like government level brainwashing and stuff and the one thing i've noticed over my lifetime is the atheist community grabs christian arguments like 10 years later and um you know for example the whole you can't prove a negative is something atheists start screaming about now well that was just a christian argument 10 years ago um indoctrination back when uh the lgbt rights before they were even called that uh the christian conservatives were talking about the schools were indoctrinating you know people into well or or now uh critical race theory so, so this idea of indoctrination is just a regurgitated, um, you know, blanket argument. And it's really used for, I don't understand why somebody could believe this. They must have been indoctrinated. And, you know, really, it just boils down to they want to, everybody's been indoctrinated now. And so it's meaningless. So when you say, what is indoctrination? I really don't know. Other than any kind of learning apparently <laughs> yeah that, that's uh that does seem to be the way a any kind of learning that uh you don't agree with that seems to be when yeah. it's used but dave d i mean do you have uh, a, a deeper definition of indoctrination for us um yeah th there's two ways you can kind of approach this there's a more classical version of indoctrination and that's that is basically a sense of education you're you're sort of taught um ideas and theories and and you're sort of brought into this education of learning and learning these ideologies and these ideas and these arguments but generally when people speak about indoctrination these days that's not what they're speaking about they're not speaking about this classical definition they're speaking about people who are being taught to accept ideas and ideologies without any critical thought. And that's generally what people are speaking about when they speak about indoctrination. You're basically being pumped full of information and ideas, um, taught not to question them, not to put critical thinking onto them, and taught that these are the only ways, and anybody who questions them just doesn't know what they're talking about. Which you could even apply to early schooling, because when you think about uh, at least how things are in primary school, it is a lot of take on this information and learn to recycle it. And this is the correct information. And there you go. So you could extend that to all education. Yeah, I got school. suspended a lot for criticizing my teachers and questioning my teachers. <laughs> so you can say that those early years could be considered indoctrination. Like when you're, I suppose this is, if you think about um, teach the controversy, you know, teach creation theory instead of evolution, that they're sort of piggybacking off that. Um, it's, well, this evolution is being taught, it's being indoctrinated into our children. They're being taught to accept it without any critical thinking, but that's a mischaracterization of how evolution is taught because you're still allowed to question it mm -hmm. um you know you'll be laughed at sure but you're still allowed to question it yeah i mean especially Whereas, as you get older i mean you, you'll have the questions and how does this bit work and da, 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 and I, that's one of the things you go on i mean your early schooling is very much you just need to learn the basics of everything and just accept it and then when you get older you start being allowed to have more. I mean, at least in our our school system, anyway. You start yeah. being allowed to have more questions. Um, it, I can give an, another example of indoctrination. Yeah, 
and I, this goes back to a topic I know we kind of hate to discuss, but the definition of atheism. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, but if you think about it, in a lot of the atheist community, you're not allowed to question whether or not atheism is just the lack of belief in God. Anybody who questions it is mocked, ridiculed, blocked, muted. So that's a form of indoctrination within the atheist community itself. Yeah, and and that certainly exists in all form of life. And, and to get with what you guys are saying, um, the kids don't have the ability to think critically. And you can't exactly. teach them that until they're maybe, you know, 13 or 12 or whatever. Uh, there's, there's a point, and we just have to make an allowance for kids just learning bad information. And, yeah, I, I certainly was exposed to a lot of bad ideas in my life growing up. Uh, in the schools, in the church, from my parents, from my friends, and uh, but there was nothing nefarious about it, right? It wasn't, you know, there's, we, like your example in the atheist community, um, it's not that hard to walk away from it. No, exactly. And, and I think that's the part that this, this whole uh, indoctrination tries to paint is that these people now, and, and for some people, yeah, it is. It's very, very hard. But I also think the hard part they have walking away from is the social things, the culture things, the the familial things. It's not the ideas. And I promise you, in every church, there's a lot of people that are shaking their heads at the bullshit and are just there to make their wife happy, their parents happy, or to, to have part of a society and part of a group. And that's that it. might be harder to walk away from from a lot of people. Like, how do you, you know, if if you're part of this whatever culture, and you decide, yeah, this is dumb, but how do you tell your parents that? How do you tell your your? It's just easier to be continue being part of the society because that's what's more important to you than the the doctrine part. So it, it's not as if, and I think the indoctrination that it. it, it absolves the indoctrinated from taking accountability of believing some dumb shit. And at some point you have to be able to say, look, I believe some dumb shit. That's on me, not the people that told me it. Shame on them for telling me it, but shame on me for believing it. And, and this indoctrination sort of thing gives people it out by saying, well, I was indoctrinated. I had no way of critical thinking at the time or whatever. And then it also paints the indoctrinator as a, as a bad guy, as an enemy, as somebody that's opposed to us. And it reinforces a us versus them sort of uh, dynamic rather than just somebody that doesn't agree with us or thinks differently. And they might even say they're they're indoctrinating us with lies, and it's like, well, you actually, if they believe it, they're not lying. It might be a falsehood, and and then we'd all say in in the terms of things like like religion or, or, or a singular definition of atheism, um, it would be a falsehood. But there are people who generally believe it. You know, when people tell me there's only mm -hmm. one definition of atheism, I truly believe that they believe that <laughs> you know and 100 percent that they believe it so strongly that you show them evidence of other definitions and they'll say no they don't count for some other shit that they're inventing in their head you know um but there are people that just don't want to be corrected on it. and it's it's funny how we atheists quite often say this about theists but never look introspectively at the things that we believe yeah. Yeah. People don't want to be wrong and people want to win. That's a bigger characteristic way past atheism and theism, right? That's just the human characteristic that just because you one day are atheist and the next day you're a theist or, or over some time, you still probably really, really want to win and you probably still really, really hate being wrong. Yeah. So that's harder to shape than a, than a belief, you know? So uh, people really, um, that's more important to them, to be right than to uh, 
re- reshape it, their beliefs. It's more important to be right than to be right, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 actually, I mean, going back to an earlier point that that you guys made, um, uh, kids aren't as equipped to think critically they can't think critically in the same way that someone with a more mature mind has and even if a teacher was to try and teach said critical thinking skills at a younger age it it wouldn't go over as well i mean they should still try if they're equipped to but it wouldn't work in the same way it would when they're older now That is in part why I think some of this indoctrination idea of religion comes across. I was I was I was raised um, Christian, went to Christian schools. um, But I think most of the way that the reason my mom taught me about Christianity was for the moral lessons. My nana is is religious and and one of my aunts is religious, but my mom's never really actually shown any interest in religion past um, getting us christened. (laughs) <laughs> you know but she's taught us like you know a lot of the moral bible stories as well as things like aesop's fables that's what she used it for and then when i went to this school i think she basically because it was a christian school just told us to go along with it but she didn't tell us that's what she was doing it was just easier to just say yeah this is this is what it is um but i don't feel that she indoctrinated me she didn't force me down any particular belief. She never punished me for questioning the beliefs. I didn't question the beliefs till I was about eight years old. And there was never a problem there. There was never any punishment there. There was never any of the stuff that you actually see from these people who do indoctrinate. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and my education, even at this Christian school, was very good. I had a very good science education and it was very accurate, at least for the time. So I don't feel that there was, you know, what my parents did were, was indoctrination. Yes, I didn't, I wasn't taught to think critically about it, but I I couldn't. I was too young to. And I think not being able to think critically is a bit different from being taught something that you have to accept without critique. That you can't question critically, yeah. yeah. And I think maybe that's a, a fine line. I mean, it's it's like Gary says here, um, indoctrination is learning what to think instead of how to think. I'd say it's not just that. I'd say there's yeah. that extra layer. Yeah, if you were going to go with that definition, then most people are being indoctrinated in public schools up till college. Yeah, and then exactly. it's the meaningless thing they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It, it, there's no actual distinction being made between education and indoctrination. And 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 that's just it. I think I think we forget that there is this additional layer. That's a good start. Yeah, it's being taught what to think, but then you need to say without the ability to critique it, without being allowed to critique it being told that any critique on it is wrong or for whatever reason is punishable with something and anything around that that's the bit that's missing from from that definition now kimo has a point as well saying that oh hey kimo by the way i didn't say hello when you entered i didn't notice um saying teaching skeptical critical thinking skills is not easy and certainly not all educators are equipped for the task not all participants participants in education pro uh in the process want it either and i think you're right there i mean there there is a lot especially from from my schooling i remember sit down shut up copy off the board you're tested on it next week because if you can recycle it you know that there, there is a, a a hell of a lot of it um there are many people who don't like that that questioning side of things and there are many people who don't think that way either. I mean, teachers are heavily underpaid and they do far more hours than they're doing it. So can you blame them for not wanting questions on this shit? This is the syllabus. You just need to learn this. But what about, no, fuck that. <laughs> like, well, I mean, and they've got 20 kids too. I mean, yeah. it's a little easier to, 
teach your, your kids, but you got 20 kids and you're trying to keep 10 of them awake, you know? Yeah. It, 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 and sometimes just putting facts out there and teaching how to read, you know, to do basic arithmetic and stuff. And, uh, you know, that, that, that is what they have to teach. So this, I, so when people say we need to teach critical thinking, you know, what they're really saying is we need to teach everyone to think like me. <laughs> Generally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> because, because, okay, well, how do we do that? What is that? You know, well, well, you just teach them to think critically. Okay. What is that? Well, they have to think critically and think critically. And then they just kind of keep it. Oh, teach them logic and reason. And then basically I always like to do is the people that just talk about logic and reason substitute the words the blood of christ into <laughs> their their statements and and it's like the same thing it's like instead of you know i, I you know i am today so happy that uh, logic and reason and then you can just put in the blood of christ and it's the same sort of sentiment it's just this <laughs> you know kind of thing it's off a platitude here. Yeah, it's a platitude, exactly. It and, is for and, a lot of people. They don't actually think about things in terms of logic and reason. They don't think about logic as logic. They're, they're sort of like doing colloquial or spot logic, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, or, or like, logic is yeah, coming but, to a conclusion that sounds reasonable. <laughs> that, that's, yeah. Right. And, and the other thing I noticed, too, is that when you see the people that have made the transformation from theists to atheists and they're like, you know, hey, uh, you know, now I'm all about logic and reason. You know, I promise you, they were, they, they, when they were saying their shitty things as Christians, they thought they were being logical and reasonable. You know, they weren't, um, it, no one ever says, man, was I really stupid? You know, they just, <laughs> you know, I was logical. Of course, I've been logical and reasonable all my life. And, and then that's kind of where the disconnect happens is so, you know, you're just being unreasonable on the other side of the fence now. Oh, uh, that's reversed. Never mind. <laughs> this is one of the ones that you brought up in the past about the, the inserting the uh, the blood of the Christ. I was going to show it off my phone because I couldn't be bothered to um, share things. Um, sometimes I feel like I may need to rethink how dedicated I am to the blood of the Christ so I can learn to better <laughs> interact with others. But what the fuck methods would I use to rethink it? <laughs> Hello, infidel. <laughs> Speaking of logic, there's someone actually the other the other day. Um, and this is a, a tweet from them. And this just shows how little they understand about logic. And it says, "I accept all your logic as sound and your reasoning as impeccable. Unfortunately, it's not factual." <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, tell me, tell I me, I don't understand. that person works in an HR department somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, tell tell me you don't understand logic. We are so pleased you with your progress as an employee, <laughs> and and we find you entirely invaluable to our operation. But we're going to be releasing you anyway. <laughs> um. So, oh, uh, Gary says, I have to disagree with Rev here. There are ways of teaching kids that our knowledge, knowledge is always tentative. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure how they that can be. Sorry. Go well, for it, they go. would first have to understand what knowledge is, what yeah. tentative is, why knowledge is always tentative. I'm, and I'm sure that seven-year-olds who watched Snoopy last night aren't really bothered by any of that. Yeah, it's really hard when you're an adult to put yourself in the mind of how you are when you're seven. And I always find that when, when you have kids, sometimes they're like surprisingly switched on. They're like really advanced, right? They, they are, they're out there, but, but other kids, most kids, as Dave just mentioned, you know, like their main interest is when can I watch this next TV show that I liked or play this next game or, oh, I I really didn't like that the these people were mean to me in the playground today. They're their main Gon concerns. Who's better, Gonzo or Fuzzy Bear? <laughs> yeah. That's most eight year olds in the nineteen eighties. Yeah. So so I yeah I, in, in uh I'll go for it. 
We lose you? I was just going to say, you know, clearly Gary is the weak link in the chat here, and he needs to step things up a little bit. He but, needs to um, step in line with I what mean, the rest no of the one is thing. saying that there aren't ways. Yeah, come on. Yeah, we're, we're clearly defined critical thinking as, as what the panel thinks. Um, <laughs> so you have to step up your critical thinking game here. But no one is saying you can't do it. I just think teachers that are able to successfully teach kids that are exceptional. And that is not the standard. It's the the exceptional um, situation. I, I so, so, I mean, Gary you know, is right with what he easy. says. You know, he is right. Yeah, that yeah, there are yeah. definitely ways, you know. I mean, you know, uh, like I said earlier, Gary, uh, we like the banter. So uh, that's why we're digging at you. And you are right. There are ways of teaching kids that our knowledge is, is always tentative. But as Dave mentioned, you know, that you have to teach them what knowledge and tentative is. And most kids aren't thinking about that. And as, as Rev said, <laughs> You have to have a really, really good teacher to do it. And as I mentioned earlier, most teachers are not paid well enough to even give a fuck, even if they are good enough to do that sort of thing. So, yes, there's definitely ways of teaching our kids that thing. But in general, and I mean, I'd say we use the 80-20 rule, but I'd say it's probably the 95-5 rule for this sort of thing. It won't happen. Um, um Going back to something you said earlier about, you know, some some people not wanting it, some people just want to be told what to think, what to do, and how to do it. A lot of people join the army because they need a job or because, you know, they have this belief that they should be protecting the country. But a lot of people join the army or the navy or whatever for the routine so that they don't have to do all this thinking. They're told when to wake up, when to eat, what to do. So I think there's a bunch of people who don't really care about critical thinking or whether knowledge is tentative. They want to be told what to think and how to do things. Uh, that's a really good point, actually. Um, so Gary says, I disagree. My five-year-old was curious. Sure, he wanted to watch TV, but there were also windows of time where it, uh, what they amaze you. I agree, right? I, I mean, I, I've got a 14-year-old, a two-year-old, and a seven-month-old. And I agree with you. There, there are definitely windows of time where, where they definitely amaze you. They, they delve deep into um, certain topics. Um, and, and I've met some other kids that, that are, are so curious. But I, I think if we, you know, if we think about 80-20, um, again, like most kids won't be that curious, especially not all the time and if you had a teacher that did have the ability and the will and want to teach these kids let's say they're five-year-olds critical thinking you'd have to catch that five-year-old at the right time and you have to find some way of getting all those five-year-olds all 20 30 in a class on the same page at the same time all willing to learn and it's not a one-on-one -on -one situation like what you could do with your kid is far more than a teacher could do with 30 you know it's a lot harder so when you do have that focus and you know you obviously had some knowledge of the situation you were going for there you know whatever she was or he sorry was asking you um, you probably had some knowledge or you were like, oh, well, let's look this up together. Let's use Google and, and let's investigate. What about this? And you look up that thing, maybe watch a video or read an article together. And then there's another question that comes up and, and then they say something and you ask an open question. Well, what makes you think that? And you have this sort of conversation and it's, it's amazing when you get on that wavelength. I completely agree with you. It's completely possible, but I don't think within the education system it's realistically possible. There's a reason Kim, Kim Kardashian is popular, as well as other social media. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this... and uh, oh, I'm sorry. And I just wanted to say uh, with. Uh, speaking about kids and windows, I'm just happy when mine aren't licking them. So 
You know, I suppose we <laughs> that was my parents' standards. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't lift the windows. We're good, you know. Yeah, I mean, Gary, Gary says yes. Uh, parents need to cultivate critical thinking critically one on one. I agree with you, and uh, it's agreed exactly. Parents can't rely on school teachers. Agreed, but then equally, you think about the average person the average person knows their job and doesn't remember much about school and doesn't necessarily think critically because they haven't been brought up thinking critically it's this ongoing cycle of things most people are used to the way things are and as dave mentioned there's there's a huge following for people who watch shows like the kardashians and there isn't a huge following for people who watch Stephen Moore and, and Graham Oppie and all of that sort of person. Um, so if it can't come from the parents and it won't come from the teacher, where does it come from? It has to come from the person themselves. And when does that happen? When they're a bit older and they go, this all seems a bit fucked. <laughs> Yeah, and in, here in the United States, there's certainly a dynamic of the the folks that are out screaming about making um, America great again. <laughs> uh, they are the ones, I mean, if you listen to them and talk to them, which I do all the time, they um, are not, again, saying, look, we're real dumb. We like Trump because we're real stupid. No, they think they have open minds. They think they're the ones that are breaking away from, you know, the, the way, you know, listening to the science books and the, the guys with the beakers and the test tubes, you know, those dummies. And they feel like they're the ones that are breaking away from, you know, and are the great thinkers of this generation. So like, they, like Joe was saying, you know, they're teaching their kids even dumber stuff. <laughs> because it, you know, degradates over time. But at no point do any of these people think they're being dumb. They, 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 you know, and, and I'm not trying. It, it's, it's that's the you know fault of pretty much everybody. Is we never really think we're doing. We can look back and say, well, that was dumb. But when we're doing stuff at the time, we generally think, hey, we're we're right on the money here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of flat earthers think they're the ones that are doing the critical thinking and questioning the status quo and all that. So, you know, perspective means a lot when it comes to considering yourself a critical thinker. Yeah, I mean, we even have it it's a on, rare commodity. On, on, on Twitter, though. Yeah. I mean, I've had it ha thrown at me because I was throwing a few different opinions around... Um, that Roman guy, do you remember him? He would go, oh, well, you're just not thinking critically. Roman Piso. To him, thinking critically is agreeing with him. And this guy is an atheist, but a bit of a conspiracy theorist. He he, he reckoned that in the 80s, that the, um, Christians brought up all the dictionaries um, and changed the definition of atheism. And even when I showed him a number of examples that went back in history, hundreds of years of different definitions of atheism. He was like, no, it's all the Christians in the 80s. So, right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I he's... wasn't thinking critically, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's also someone that argues that the Romans created Jesus from scratch in order to make the Jewish population easier to control 200 years after they lost control of Israel, <laughs> which seems, yeah. And, and he also argues that animals are atheists as well. Well, they are. They, they like belief in God. <laughs> <laughs> no argument there. <laughs> Dolphins are clearly philosophical atheists, though. I think I think that that has been determined, especially when they rape seals. Yeah. Uh, Kimo says, uh, essentially, all of humanity's greatest discoveries seem to come from someone asking a good, insightful question. I think emphasizing question asking over answer giving is vital to education. Uh, that's a really great take, and I completely agree, Kimo. 
Yeah, that's one of the reasons I like the saying, there are no stupid questions. I mean, it takes it a bit far because there are stupid questions. Most definitely are. <laughs> but it, yeah, but it <laughs> sort of encourages people to ask questions. Okay, you've asked a dumb question. Here's why it's not right. But don't treat the person like they've asked a dumb question. No. Tell them why. It's yeah. A, Encourage that, question asking. Exactly. All that was was an, an error in, in their, their understanding. And answering the question well might lead to a better question in the future. Um, so, no, no, I, I'm with you. I, though there are times when there, there are certain questions where you're just like, really? <laughs> I should where kick you... you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, honestly, atheist, I uh, didn't see you drop in either. Um, <laughs> and Kimo also says, uh, conspiracy theorists love to style themselves as uber skeptical in their belief forming activities. They do. But I think I think generally um, people like to think of that, that themselves as quite skeptical. Most theists think of themselves as skeptical. Most atheists think of themselves as skeptical. Most atheists will say theists can't be skeptical because if they were skeptical... They'd be theists. Uh, they'd be atheists, you know. And you're like, okay, that's not what skepticism is. Skepticism and atheism are not the same thing. Um, <laughs> I uh, <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, so indoctrination is not just being taught what to think. It's being taught what to think uncritically without the ability to question um at all there is there is more to indoctrination than most people will say like when we we think about you know people are only religious or theists because of indoctrination that's not exactly true right i wasn't indoctrinated i just didn't think to question and when i did think to question here we are there's more to it in between, and you can read my post on why do I believe no gods exists if you want on Answers in Reason, but shortcut, right? I questioned, I got hit. So when um, we think about... Sorry, Dave, go for it. Oh, uh, no, you finish, and I'll, I'll go after that. I was just going to say, so when, when we think about indoctrination, it's a lot more seedy than just being taught what to think. It's having these ideas hammered into you in such a way that you have to think it. So when we think about that, people who have been genuinely indoctrinated, what do you think the sort of effects on them are as human beings? Fear, nervousness, um kind of worried about stepping out of line. Have you ever heard of the Japanese proverb, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down? I feel like in an indoctrinated scenario, a lot of people feel like that. That makes a lot of sense. And I think too, taking it from another angle, if you truly believe somebody is indoctrinated, why do you think that your meme or your silly little argument is going to change their, you know, years and years of programming. So yeah. I always feel like like the indoctrination angle is is very dishonest. And just like the um, mental illness is, you know, if you truly believe this person is either mentally ill or indoctrinated, then then shouldn't you approach them with empathy and soft hands and and words rather than Here's my shitty meme, and here's my, you know, uh, reason why you're dumb. No, so you are being snarky and throwing memes at people because you know that in the back of your head, they're just disagreeing with you. They truly aren't mentally ill or truly indoctrinated. Because if you came across somebody, I would hope that you were like, oh, this person has been messed up, you wouldn't feel the need to just own them in a debate or whatever and why even debate that person you know so if, if if you truly do believe that indoctrination is the problem then the approach is not argumentation on twitter or hang up phone calls it's treatment 
it's uh, those sorts of avenues, you know, get these people help, treatment, understanding, rather than, um, hey, we need more means. Yeah, so there's a reason. Oops, sorry. I, I was just going to quickly say there's a reason that culty programmer is a profession and a skill, not just a title. Exactly. And I, it's it's largely been shown that, that apologetics, for example, doesn't really have much effect, especially on non-believers. The main purpose of apologetics is to keep people believing and those that are potentially having doubts to keep them, you know, bring them back in to, to, to the faith, to make, to give them a stronger belief again. It doesn't well, really well, do and for, for, for us atheists. Well, and historically, apologetics was for Christians to argue about certain ideas within Christianity, like infant baptism or post-millennialism and stuff like that. It wasn't meant for, here's why you should believe in Jesus. No. It was, here's why we believe infants should be baptized as opposed to believers. So it's kind of like Pascal's wager. I was it's just going to bring that one up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's meant for people that already believe. That's part of the given statement. Apologetics historically, because, again, you know, um, people always like to make it seem like this time is the worst time, this time is the best time. Everybody's coming for me, and nah, you know, you know, most throughout history, most Christian arguing is with other Christians, uh, not atheists. They're not writing a lot of books. They're just, and, and honestly, wouldn't give them the time of day most of the time, you know. But rather than let's argue about why the Catholics are baptizing babies, rather than why we're baptizing adults, because there's a whole discussion that needs to be had there. That's where apologetics comes from. Mm -hmm. And counter-apologetics, by the same token, probably doesn't do much to convince theists that they're wrong either. It's more uh, strengthening uh, an, an atheist's belief or moving an agnostic closer towards atheism. Um, so... Yeah, it, as much as I love philosophy or religion, a lot of that is very much the same thing. Yeah. And it it seems strange that knowing this, you know, the, the evidence points to this, that, you know, apologetics really only works for, for the theists and counter-apologetics really only works for, you know, atheists. <laughs> if you come in with meme bombs and the like or just telling people they only believe what they believe because they're indoctrinated regardless of whether they actually are indoctrinated or not it's not going to do anything so all you're doing in this situation has been like look at me i'm so super smart rational and you're an indoctrinated cat yeah um one thing i've always said about those sort of meme bombing atheists is that they're no different than the priest during an exercise, exorcism or in the film The Exorcist throwing holy water on somebody going the power of Christ compels you. It's just a way of scaring off whatever weird thing they think is going on. Exactly. Definitely. And, and I'll throw in something controversial here just because, you know, that's me. And... Um, a lot of people kind of put indoctrination, especially atheists, into a religious category. Well, it's the religious that indoctrinate people. But if you think back to communist Russia, communist Albania, countries like that, there is very much an indoctrination of atheism going on. There was the League of Atheists, I think it was called. And they were, in, it was sort of like the Hitler youth, but sort of think of the atheist youth, the communist youth. They were encouraged to rat out their parents who were still praying. They were, you know, indoctrinated to believe that all religious thing was harmful to humanity. It's the opium of the masses. So you can kind of be indoctrinated into a style of atheism as well. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. One that will probably get tons of us to uh unsubscribe 
that's but, what I'm here for. You know, <laughs> can't change the facts, man. You can disagree with them, but you can't change them. <laughs> I mean, it, it was in response to sort of securing the communist view and securing yeah. the view that the party is the is the church, but it's still indoctrinating into atheism and anti-theism. So to put things in terms of fantasy that is sort of based around fact, um, we like our films. If you think about the film um, like The Bourne Identity, you could say that Jason Bourne is someone that has been indoctrinated into a certain way of thinking, even if it was his choice to be that. He was basically indoctrinated to the point where his will was taken away from him and and the other agents in that that um and so so convinced of whatever it was they were doing and given orders and just following them that that you could say that that was closer to um indoctrination than what most people think of as indoctrination So if we think about that, there are examples of that sort of happening. So you could say that certain um, practices, especially within uh, Christianity, where they, um, I forget the name of what it's called, but when they they try and, you know, pray the gay away, um, (laughs) That could be a form of indoctrination. It generally doesn't work. It might convince someone to behave a certain way for a certain amount of time, but they are indoctrinated into a certain behavior pattern, but it doesn't last. <laughs> because yeah, and, the- and the reason they do that, and uh, I was watching a movie called The Hunt. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's pretty good. But Fantastic it's about- film, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there was this part where this uh, the, the 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 liberal elites basically say you created your own monsters, you know, you you you, and, and so here's and this is why I say the indoctrination angle isn't something new, right? It was used before the the when the Christian conservatives came out. And we're saying, you know, schools are indoctrinated. They needed a bad guy. Why? Because they could not just say people are genetically predisposed for this. Because then that means God made them that way. So they needed a boogeyman. And there they go. They created indoctrination because, well, how do you explain people being gay, you know, or or whatever? Well, because they were taught that in school. They were indoctrinated. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, that was the thing. And that was a huge, huge thing. It's, and now, in the schools are saying, well, kids are being taught to be racist. You know, um, they're, they're getting taught, you know, to, to be this. So you have this, you know, and school can't defend themselves for the most part. So you've got, you've created this boogeyman. And the religious folks really needed it because if they don't have it, then the bad guy turns out plot twist is God. And they just, they just can't have that. They need that indoctrination angle. So that's why I get pretty skeptical of it when atheists lean on it too heavily, because it's the the same thing. You're trying to create this boogeyman of, you know, nefarious Sunday school teachers, um, you know, passing out Jesus and lemon bars to everybody. And, um, you know, putting them on on a bad path for life. They need a bad guy rather than it's just the way it is. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Gary has actually sort of brought us back on track. (laughs) Well done, Gary. (laughs) You'll notice that we do go off on tangents quite often. Um, And he says, the question was, what effect indoctrination causes? And he says, the answer is it gives the person a set of glasses to view the world um and the best approach is to is to suggest trying a new lens prescription that's a really good way to look at it and i think you're right it does give them i mean it doesn't just give them 
a, a set of glasses to view the world. It forces them to use a particular set of glasses. Um, so suggesting trying a new lens, definitely. It generally, if they have truly been indoctrinated, or even if they just are really strong, firm in their position, you know, getting them to consider that change for a second, it, it I find it can be very, very, very difficult to get someone to even consider looking at things slightly differently. The most effective way I've personally found is with humour and humility and respect and just, you know, building rapport. You know, if you, my experience with the theists that have come round somewhat or, or thought about things differently or have learned to see atheists differently or at times have changed their, their ontological position, they've all been the ones that I've built a rapport with and had a good conversation with and sort of made, made a friend out of them. And for the most part, I will say... I haven't changed any minds on their, their their beliefs that they hold dear to their ego, just perhaps change their minds about how they view atheists and atheism and um, maybe how morality could be objective without God and, and things like that. Just, you know, some of the outside topics. Getting right into the core is, is very, 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 very difficult. Um, <laughs> But that's the thing as well. There, there, there are so many different types of theists, even within a particular religion, that you can't tell any of them with the same brush. You can't just assume that they have a particular set of glasses on. You need to find out what their prescription is first before you can try and change it. <laughs> um, but I, I love the metaphor, if you hadn't realised there, Gary. <laughs> really good. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, <clears throat> think of how hard it is to get people who consider themselves to be critical thinkers and to be open-minded um, and actually base a lot of their character and personality and what they project out into the world on those things. How hard is it to get them to change their mind when they're firm in a belief? So imagine how much more difficult it is to people who believe that they cannot be wrong. Mm, exactly. Definitely. Um, Do you guys ever think about giant squids at all? Uh, only erotically. What do you mean? <laughs> well, I <laughs> think... Cthulhu. I, yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, right. Uh, so, giant squids have always been interesting to me because for centuries and centuries, you got these seamen going out on boats, right? And they're, like, drawing pictures of this shit. They're, like, telling these stories. And all the science people are like, yeah, you guys are full of shit. There's no such thing as giant squids. Giant squids don't exist. Why do you think giant squids exist? And they're like, well, these assholes pull us off our boat, need us. Look, I made a drawing. And they're like, yeah, but you guys believe in mermaids and, and all this other crazy shit, too. And uh, so for the longest time, for decades and decades, people, the scientific community did not accept that giant squids exist. And then about maybe only like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, a big fucking giant squid washes up on the shore somewhere in Japan, and they're like, oh, well, holy shit, giant squids exist. So, you know, who was right and who was wrong? You know, were the science communities, you know, um, uh, right to be skeptical? Probably. Seamen, sailors don't have the best track record. <laughs> Obviously, they're all pissed. <laughs> they were right because they're going on personal experience. And I promise you, one of those scientists were like, "Your personal experience don't mean shit to me," <laughs> you know. And, and 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 yet, until there was this, you know, big fucking giant squid on the shore, nobody believed it, you know, or or I should say, the scientific community. So. People really get ratcheted into a place of not believing things. And the only thing they would believe was if a giant squid actually came out. So it seems like to me, you, you want to be, you want to always leave that door open that a big fucking giant squid is going to show up on your beach one day. Yeah, yeah right? absolutely. I, I would. So that's why I think about giant squids a lot. 
<laughs> for me, it was silly accounts. The, is that the fish? Similar sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the silly account was believed to be um, extinct. Extinct. Yeah, and they were actually found to be existing in some river in I think it it might have been North Africa somewhere. Um, and scientists were told, well, no, these fish aren't extinct. They're in my river. I eat them. You know, I fish them and eat them. And the scientific community was kind of like, well, no, they're extinct. Yeah, and they're like, here's our meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and basically, well, we know these are extinct. They're prehistoric. Um, and these village kids were like, no, 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 they exist. And nobody would believe them because as far as they knew, you know, like Rev said, personal experience don't mean shit. You know, maybe you're wrong about the kind of fish you're seeing. Until eventually they sent an expedition. It was like, holy fuck, these things do actually still exist. And then we're like, oh my God, we have to update our memes now. <laughs> yeah, basically. Because <laughs> the scientists were like, well, these kids can't be right. They have no meme. Do you have a meme? Yeah. They're not even skeptics. They believe in voodoo and gods. They can't be right. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> I mean, if you think about the first scientist who was told that the platypus existed, what, what do you think they would say? You know what I mean? It's Fuck here's off. this weird cre Yeah, here's this weird creature that's a mammal that gives pouch birth and you know, uh, like you know, eggs. egg birth and rears has them in beak. their pouches and yeah, has a beak and a poisonous tail. You're gonna go. What the fuck kind of weed are you smoking and where can I buy some? <laughs> yeah. Or if you're if you're a Christian, what kind of weed was God smoking that day when he created the duck billed platypus? <laughs> yeah, I have to admit that's one of my favorite Robin Williams routines. Oh, it was yeah. I, I I thought that was Bill Hicks. Well, they probably both did it, but yeah. Robin Williams did it as well, yeah. yeah. It, Robin Williams probably did it first. The platypus just kinda like you know, like um coffee vendors they always have like like coffee vendors that sell coffee beans to various places they always have special blends which is basically just the shit that fell on the floor and then they just <laughs> sweep it up and put it in the bag that was the platypus basically it's like what the fuck do we do with this beak we got this poisonous tail and guys was just like I, I don't know just just you know put a pouch on it and Call Set it, it off. We gotta get out of here. <laughs> it's, it's a quamble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, guys, um, I stupidly drank three beers whilst I was doing the mix, so uh, I need a brief break. Um, do you guys need a, a, a refill or a break yourself, or shall I leave you talking? Oh, Dave needs a refill. Yeah, right, I so, need a refill. So should we reconvene in a couple of minutes? Yeah. Like, like yep. for you. I've still got vodka left, so I'll be back in a minute. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're taking a brief interlude, so please bear with us. Please feel free to get any questions in, and we will answer them after the break. Are you we're... too young for that? <laughs> so, am I too young for what? Sorry. Dave's not here, man. Oh, no, Dave's not here. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> it's Dave. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> He used to love Cheech and Chong. Dave. <laughs> Dave's not here, man. I think it was my 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 dad that introduced me to Cheech and Chong. Actually, um. <laughs> I saw them first on TV when I was about nine and fell in love. <laughs> you know, they they really didn't age well, though. Well, depends on the film. Yeah, Up in Smoke did. Yeah. But but overall, like the humor is funny to me because of the time. But like I think people today would be like, "Oh, this is hilarious." They're more like half baked or how high. Uh, yeah. I um I, I find a lot of of, of old humor um, doesn't actually age well though. I mean, there are certain things that I used to watch that. I mean, for example, I used to find uh, Eddie Murphy. Um, really funny <laughs> and i can't watch it without cringing now i mean i'm talking about his stand-up some of his movies are, are still really good and entertaining i love the beverly hills cop yeah. series and all of that but um <laughs> yeah his stand-up i'm just like oh my god how did i ever find this funny <laughs> sort of thing some of the stuff he says I still kind of like delirious his very first stand-up film yeah 
I think it's the one. Uh, Raw was when he was in the red suit, wasn't it? Raw. That yeah, was, that's Raw, Mr. Yeah. P and the Honeymooners, and yeah, that that stuff's pretty yeah. cringy, but yeah. But um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're back in the room. If you hadn't noticed, <laughs> um. So um. We're discussing indoctrination and the effects that it has. And um, thank thank you again, Gary, for sort of bringing us back on that. You know, we we're talking about the effects of indoctrination um, and it, it, it giving someone a specific lens. And we also discussed that it can be hard to break said lens um, and, and to get someone to, to, to uh, do it. Now, now, if someone is truly heavily indoctrinated, there is a chance that they never actually learn those critical thinking skills as well. There could be someone that is heavily indoctrinated from a young age, and or even if they're not heavily indoctrinated, there could be someone that still never learned those critical thinking skills as they grow up. But if they are heavily indoctrinated, this could be an even bigger issue. And if someone never learns those critical thinking skills, there's a good chance that you'll never be able to change their mind because they will only ever accept their original epistemic bubble of information. And at that point, there's very little point in talking to someone like that. Really, if, if you're well, trying it, to change their mind, there's a lot of point if you're trying to learn about them and why they believe what they believe and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, someone who has been through that specific experience can be very difficult to talk to. Sorry, Rev, I cut you off there. Yeah, I was going to say, too, and if someone has been heavily indoctrinated or immersed even in a school of thought, when they come out of it, in my experience, I find those folks very skeptical of absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they do not want to hear anything from anybody um, and are going to be resistant to anybody saying, well, that was dumb, but, but check this out. This is smart. And, people tend to sort of go, I was highly suggestive. Now I'm absolutely shut off. And it's like a you know pendulum, people swing back and forth. And there's also a lot of anger that comes along with those things because they, they hate how, they hate themselves for being so duped. And that anger is then taken outwardly who believes the things that they used to. How can you be so stupid to believe this thing? Can't you see? I realized it. Why can't you realize it? Right. And, that, and that's why you need a boogeyman. You need <laughs> a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Um, so if we think about it, you know, the, the effects of claiming indoctrination is happening. Now, when I was a theist, and we, we've covered this off already, but I, I wasn't indoctrinated, right? I mean, it, was just, it was just what was believed. It was, it, there was nothing, from how we've discussed indoctrination tonight, there was nothing that says I was indoctrinated. And if at that point in my life, I'd met an atheist and went, you only believe because you've been indoctrinated. And I understood what indoctrination was. I'd turn around and go, no, nah, fuck off. So one of the effects of pulling out the indoctrination card is actually to lose the battle. <laughs> if, if you're genuinely trying to convince theists that they are wrong, telling them that they've been indoctrinated when they haven't been, isn't going to win you any favors because, well, they haven't been, so they already know that you're wrong about one thing, so they'll probably assume you're wrong about other things. And if they have been indoctrinated and you tell them, well, it's not going to work anyway. <laughs> yeah. So there's no point in yeah, us atheists I, pulling out that fucking card. <laughs> yeah, and, and to what you were saying, to take it even a little further, 
when atheists start treading into things like biblical um, questions. You know, I was, there was kind of a, I uh, was reading a Twitter thread about talking about Abraham and Isaac, right? Abraham's the dad, he's going to kill Isaac. So the question is, you ask, um, if God told you to kill your son like he did with Abraham, would you do it? And, you know, that's kind of this gotcha sort of question for Christians. And atheists kind of wander into this and there was this uh, Hebrew scholar who answered it. And of course, he's got nuances till Thursday about this question. So you're like, well, you know, you believe this, you believe, you, you know, you either have to say, yeah, my God is evil or I'm going to kill my son. And there's a whole lot of nuance in between. And uh, so, yeah, if you come in with like you're indoctrinated and I think you either believe in the most evil thing ever or you're going to kill your son because you've walked into this weeds of biblical nuance that you really shouldn't be talking about. Um, and it's an interesting discussion to have, but you're presenting, you're not presenting it as an honest discourse because the answer for everybody should be, no, I wouldn't kill my son or my daughter if anybody told me to. And that should be the beginning and the end of it. But if you want to have a philosophical discussion and you have to allow for the nuance, and then if you really want an honest you know, some guy that's a Hebrew scholar to go into, well, this is what this was all about, and this is the context of it all. Now you're in the weeds because he's discussing, you know, context, uh, metaphors, and all of that. And, um, you know, the, the pulling out the indoctrination thing is is, is pretty simplistic. And, and if the person hasn't been indoctrinated, like you said, they're going to tell them to cut off. And if they had been indoctrinated, Thank I'll listen to you anyway. Yeah, exactly. And um, Gary, Gary uh, has said a, a similar thing as well, you know, uh, don't pull out the card, but keep it in mind. And, and mm -hmm. that's right. I, uh, Gary, Gary, I like you. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> um, it, but that, that, that's just it. Don't, don't pull it up, but keep it in mind. And you're going to have to try and work out if someone has actually been genuinely indoctrinated and then the way you interact with them might change. And that's a big part of actually having a conversation with someone is learning how to interact with them. I'm lucky with, with these gents that are joining me tonight, you know, a couple of dicks and they suit me fine because I'm a cunt. You know. Uh... <laughs> but... We can have that conversation, yet if it was someone else on the internet and I was to say that same sort of thing, that could go down awfully, right? Because that's not the way to communicate with them. And the same can be said with when you're dealing with someone who just happens to be a theist and someone who has gone through hardcore indoctrination. The way you're going to communicate with them it's going to be different. Every single person has very, very different life experiences as well. And just because they're a Christian doesn't mean they're going to always believe the same things other Christians do. That's why you've got so many denominations. It's why you've got universalists and annihilationists and all of that sort of thing. So you can't just assume what any Christian believes. Even, right? One of the things most Christian believe is is about Christ being the Son of God and rose from the dead. But I mean, Rev, you were telling us that that's not something that Christian scientists necessarily believe, is it? No, no, <laughs> no. no, no. In fact, in fact, the whole Trinity confuses and scares us. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we do not understand that at all, and I think we're just we're the ones being honest. Um, but yeah, so so and. You know, like I say, I've never believed that anybody's going to hell. I've never believed the earth is flat. Uh, most Christians aren't, I mean, they have some, it's like, like a song, right? Or a, like, a, like a, if you listen to Bob Dylan, you'd be like, oh, that song really speaks to me. And that's, the Bible's no different, right? Any person with any sort of open mind is going to read it and say, you know what, that, you know, that makes sense to me. You know, my favorite verse is, the workman's worth is higher. I mean, I'd put that on my gravestone. And, uh, you know, so, so different 
things speak to different people. But yeah, it, it, not every, in fact, very, you know, very few Christians that I've run across in my life believe the earth is flat. They don't give a shit how old the earth is. And things like that aren't critical to them. They're trying to figure out how to get to heaven or how to please God or whatever. They're not worried about, you know, some random verse talking about, you know, bats and birds and shit like that. If they even <laughs> know that it exists. You know, so... Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, to, to cast such a wide generalization, I think a lot of times a lot of uh, theists are, or that all theists are Christian. You know, there's a huge disconnect oh, with that, yeah. too. <laughs> so and, much so. Uh, yeah, you know, and when I look back on it, I look as myself was probably more of a deist than anything. And when you try to put absolutely complicated people like Adolf Hitler or George Washington into one camp or the other, you know, to me, it's like you want Adolf Hitler on the other team, you want George Washington on your team. And, you know, both of them were not atheists, but they weren't Christians either. So that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the reality. And it's all right to say that the founding fathers were, you know, not for the most part evangelical Southern Baptist Christians, but they weren't atheists either. Even like Thomas Jefferson, I seriously doubt was an absolute atheist, you know. So, but it doesn't matter, right? And but but to to try to paint them with a brush one way or the other is again trying to win a debate or or um, go down a bad path, I guess. I did see somebody the other day trying to claim Aristotle as somebody who is proof of how great atheism is. I remember that is. conversation. Yeah. Considering that he they believed were saying in a prime mover, was an atheist. Yeah, it's, oh. Aristotle was clearly not an atheist. He had complicated views, but he clearly was not an atheist. It's like... Like you said, Rev, if you can paint the ones you dislike as members of the other camp, it gives you a good idea to, or it gives you a good excuse to paint the other camp as bad. Anybody who thinks critically must be in your camp kind of thing. Yeah, um, and, and Isaac Newton, for example, wrote more about the Bible than he did about physics. Yeah, it was very little he wrote about science compared to how much he wrote about religion. Yeah, and most of it is is pretty interesting, and, and I think he was uh, fascinated with the numerology of the Bible. Like, he wasn't a Trinitarian, I don't think, but all of that revelation in Daniel, um, there was a time where people were trying to, quote-unquote, quote crack the code, like, figure that shit out. And Newton's like, hey, I'm the smartest guy that ever lived, that ever will live. I'm going to figure this shit out. So he sat there and he, he went through the whole thing and the metaphors about what a week actually meant and this and that, the other thing. And that was like a huge deal was trying to figure out all of the, of the and the funny thing is it was probably three dicks like us sitting around, you know, just, just writing random shit down and going, well, that sounds really good. And then waking up the next morning and they're like, what? And they're like, fuck it, we got to publish it. You know, we got to get this to the publisher. Let's just run Welcome with it. Welcome to most of philosophy. Yeah. 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 They spent like, they had 24 hours and they spent 23 and a half hours drinking and arguing. And then 30 minutes from just writing shit down. And then they're like, yeah, we got to get this printed. So, yeah, it's like, then, here's a napkin. I wrote some yeah. stuff on it, make that publishable. And then 1,500 years later, the greatest mind humans have ever known is trying to make sense of it all. And, and then, then when they got together and they're in heaven or whatever, and uh, Newton's like, like, so how close was I? And they're like, Man, we were so messed up. You know? <laughs> you know how many mushrooms I ate that day? Yeah. That's well, one of the things I like about it. the good place, though, isn't it? Like, most, most religions, only 5% right, except this one guy who was on a mushroom trip who got it about 95% right. <laughs> 
And even he still went to the bad place. He did. He did. And that's a spoiler. So I apologize if you haven't seen The Good Place. Honestly. Yeah, fuck gonna... you. If you haven't watched it yet, it's your own problem. <laughs> but I would suggest check it out. I'm I'm on my third run through. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I like having a, a, a sitcom as a bit of background fodder. Um, and sort of The Good Place fits in that. But what The Good Place also has is layers below the, the comedy. and It's a super clever show, yeah. It really is. There's, there's stuff that... Especially if you've got a slight interest in philosophy, just a slight interest in philosophy, a little bit of knowledge, you'll start noticing things. And then if you listen to stuff and maybe like look up stuff... I mean, on my, my second watch through, um, having done... Uh, a lot of our, our, our live streams and, and looked into a lot of stuff myself, I've picked up on more stuff um, than, than I did the first time. Um, just just little Easter eggs, but also some of the stuff that, that um, Chidi, who is a, a professor of moral for philosophy, is talking about that I didn't quite get the first time through. And it's just like, oh... So there is there is so much to that show. You can appreciate it with no knowledge of philosophy, and it's funny. But if you have a bit, oh, brilliant. Even better. So much better, in fact. Um, sorry. <laughs> Again, any chance I get to talk about and advertise The Good Place, I, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> it's one of the only shows where I own all the box sets. Yeah, nice. Or one of the few shows, yeah. Um, Funnily enough, Grimm is another one. Really? Yeah, because I can pick them up for like two quid each. Ah, fair enough. I, I I I watched two or three seasons of that, and then it disappeared from Netflix or whatever it was on, and I've never really followed up on it. I I just enjoyed the supernatural element of it and the Grimm's fairy tales element of it, and yeah. it was just one of those you could put on in the background while studying. Did you like the TV series Supernatural? Up until about the sixth season. It goes through peaks and troughs at that point, um, but I'd say it's worth watching to the end. You could tell it all built up to a climax, and then they thought, fuck it, this is too popular to let go. We'll just try and continue the writing, and then stretched it out for another four seasons. See, the, the, well, I think there were 15 seasons in the end. And and that's sort of what happened. There was the occasional season where it was just like, uh, that just wasn't as good. And then all of a sudden, the next season would come back absolutely fantastic again. Um, uh, the, the, the wife and I loved watching them. The only good show about angels and demons warring and God, or not show, but anything like that, is the film The Prophecy. I don't think I've actually seen that one. You that's fucking Christopher lame. Walken, right? Yeah, that's Christopher Walken. Yeah, in his prime. Yeah, it's an amazing film, and has one of the most amazing shots in any film, where he walks away from the corpse and he just kind of goes. And it all kind of burns in this shape of an angel, and it, it's got some really great camera work and cinematography in it, you, and a really good idea. Please remind me at some point in the, in the future when when I can to to add that one to my media server. Yeah, it's got Eric Stoltz in it as well, who is absolutely amazing. I mean, can I plug this show? Sorry, yeah, of course you can. Okay. And this is one that has a lot of religious um, interesting aspects is uh, The Good Lord Bird with Ethan Hawke, who is amazing in it. I've not yeah, heard it. Ethan nice. Hawke tends to be pretty Ethan Hawke is amazing, yeah. He is, like, surprisingly so. I look at his face and I think, you can't act, and then he does, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> and then he does he training day. absolutely yeah. phenomenal as John. You know, of course, now you guys probably don't know, know that much about John Brown, right? No. Okay. So John Brown, in the, the um, early stages of the Civil War, or before the Civil War, was in Kansas and um, fighting Kansas, basically. So before the Civil War in the United States, you had states getting added in as either free states or um, slave states. And this was a huge contention because 
the balance would obviously throw our Senate and, you know, the Senate was just as messed up if not more than it is now, if you can even believe that. So they called it bloody Kansas. So John Brown is, you know, kind of, you've seen pictures probably of him. He's got this huge ass beard. He looks insane. And he probably was a little bit, but he was this fervent abolitionist that was like 100% religious and Christian about it. So he was like, and he probably, because then he went to Virginia at Harper's Ferry, and there was the famous um, uh, massacre or whatever with John Brown. But, uh, you know, you always hear on on Twitter the uh, whole slavery argument about uh, United States slavery and religion. And, you know, um, the slavers were all religious. The abolitionists were all religious. And in reality, probably 99.9% of the people in the United States were racist, you know, whether they were abolitionists or not, you know, but they sort of take this, like, the atheists take this stance of, like, you know, slavery was this Christian, you know, institution. And certainly the Bible condoned it and certainly didn't speak against it, but also there were Christians like John Brown that basically started the Civil War with nothing more than his conviction in Christianity. And he was just like, you know, quoting the Bible. There, you, you know the song, Dave, probably, maybe, Joe, this is before you time, the song Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas. Carry On My Wayward that, Son. Right. Brilliant and there's that famous it. album picture with the dude with the long beard. That's John Brown. Right. And uh, Ethan Hawke is just incredible. And it's not it's, it's funny. Like they 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 they, they make uh, John Brown struggles with reality, let's say, kind of darkly funny. So um, it, it's easy to watch, but it's just this brilliantly acting thing. And it, it really addresses the role of religion in the Civil War and uh you know, the the early days. But it's not like a historical docudrama by any stretch of the imagination. But a very enjoyable show. And with a lot of the, the Christianity slash slavery discussions, um, I found it sort of apt. Yeah. Uh, sounds interesting as well. It is. And, and Ethan Hawke is just phenomenal in it. And they have like Frederick. Doug- I mean, the, the characters are phenomenal, and um, I'm on my second time through it. But uh, you know, you get a lot of the whole as if Christians are entirely to blame for the Civil War and slavery, whereas everybody was pretty much a theist back then. Everyone was pretty much a racist, and the Civil War was going to happen probably one way or the other. But John Brown was a big part of the spark, you know, the, the powder keg that blew it up, got on everyone's radar. And Kimo agrees you, with you. He says uh, that John Brown series was really good and hilarious and that you're spot on, Rev. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I know, like, for folks that aren't, you know, um, English or in the UK, the, the United States Civil War isn't probably a thing of very interest, but... Um, I also think it kind of points to, you know, like people are like, man, your country is messed up. Well, yeah, we were pretty, been pretty messed up the whole time since you guys sent all your assholes over here. (laughs) Um, We've been dealing with messed up for like 400 years, you know, the sale of witch trials. And, you know, it's, it's not like we just got messed up in the last four years. You know, we've been pretty seriously fucked for, uh, since day one. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you got the, the Brits, the French, and the Spaniards all over there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and all the guys that were too crazy for your country, we got them. So. Yeah, I was just Thanks about to that. say, there's a reason we sent you all of our fundamentalists. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it backfired, didn't it, Dave? We should have all gone mm-hmm. over there and left the fundamentalists in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, well, we've just 
been left with the mentalist, so <laughs> you know it's kind of a fair trade. <laughs> Um, so do you guys think that there is anything else that we, we, we need to, to cover tonight? I know we've skirted around, um, a lot of the topic and there's probably particular aspects we could delve into deeper, perhaps in a, in a future stream, but is there anything else about indoctrination that you think needs to be covered or addressed, um, tonight? Yeah, I think the term is thrown around a little too easily. And it makes for good press, and it makes for good, um, it makes for a nice, easy backing, getting people supporting you. Well, look at how bad, the, what's the current one? Um, what's his name? James Lindsay is his name. Groomers. People are grooming children into accepting transsexuals and the, um accepting critical race theory and critical race theories indoctrination um there's a lot of that that's kind of ignored and i think indoctrination is thrown around too easily and it's become a very political buzzword and i think that's even true within the atheist community like well the only reason religious people believe is um because they're indoctrinated well what about the fact that you believe that they're indoctrinated? Is that an indoctrination in and of itself? Like, how much of what you believe and are unwilling to question, coming from atheists themselves, is indoctrination in and of itself? Yeah, I, I mean, we could say, just for an example, um, when, and, and I wrote about this in, in detail in that article I mentioned earlier, but... Um, when I sort of joined the online debate world, when I was looking into things a bit more, I I was almost indoctrinated into thinking atheism was only a lack of belief in God. It's not what I believed beforehand, but it's what I was taught rep repetitiously and the way people said it, the way people acted, if anyone said anything differently, um, you weren't allowed to be critical of this particular thing and if you wanted to be part of the tribe you had to say this thing <laughs> you know um and so the first time getting into a conversation after having this rammed into me for five years where someone went well that's not the only definition in fact that's that's a pretty shit definition i went it wasn't you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell, that makes a change. Um, it was uh, it was someone that that, that linked me to um, the article on SEP, and I I was very standoffish with them. And then I took some time back, and then read the SEP again. Right, and at some point where I wasn't in a conversation with someone, where I wasn't feeling combative. And then that's when I had the conversation with you, Dave. And I and I went, Dave, you're you're doing philosophy, aren't you? And we... I'm butchering philosophy. <laughs> that's more of the, the words you want. But that's that's how we got like properly talking. Is the fact that I'd had this conversation with with someone else, and it had it had planted a seed in my mind. But at the time, I thought they were a dick, and. I was in an argumentative state of mind. Um, and then I turned around and had a conversation with you. And then we went on to have those conversations about morality and things like that. And you started pointing me into different resources and all those things. And, and here we are today doing, uh, well, the Fresh Air podcast and the sci-fi show on, on YouTube. Um, and and that's that's where we came to it. But you could argue the way that other atheists behaved when I was in these Facebook groups, they indoctrinated me, right? I didn't feel any of that pressure growing up in religion, but I, in the same way that I did when I joined the Facebook groups and atheists told me that I had to believe X and atheism was only Y and, you know, and the funny thing now is I'm probably 
a stronger atheist if you want to think about it in a in a line than than they ever were i'm more sure of my position that no gods exists than than they ever were as as fence sitters but there was a time when i was convinced that they were right just because of how these ideas were badgered into me and you could say that there is that sort of indoctrination and this happens quite often online there is a certain level of indoctrination that goes around with certain in groups and that's that's part of tribalism really you could say tribalism is a form of indoctrination not necessarily intentional indoctrination it's the harder thing to escape Most yeah yeah absolutely and that's something i was going to bring up is that there's a sense of subtle indoctrination that goes on in many groups and um, you might not realize you're being indoctrinated because it's very very subtle it's you have to use these words and um, think of we've been in a discussion with somebody recently over the last couple of days who you know his arguments aren't particularly good but one thing he said was that you claim to be an atheist but you're not opposed to religion so in other words he discounts anybody who is not opposed to religion as an actual atheist if if you're not against religion you're only claiming to be an atheist and we see that a lot there's many names I could bring up, like somebody that we got blocked and unblocked by um, because of the burden of proof discussion, who said, well, you're not arguing against the theists, you're arguing against atheists, therefore you must be a theist. That's a very subtle sense of indoctrination that stops you criticizing the in-group that you belong to. Mm. And most people don't spot stuff like that. And they don't realize that that in and of itself is a sense of indoctrination. Yeah, it's, it is, as you say, I mean, I, I suppose you could say tribalism is in itself is, is subtle indoctrination. It, it's a form of indoctrination. Yeah. And tribalism is something that's perfectly natural. So that entails that certain forms of indoctrination are also perfectly natural. That's not saying natural is good. Snake bites are natural. <laughs> but they're not good, yeah. Shitting yeah. in your own mouth is natural, but it's not good, <laughs> yeah. you know. Probably doesn't taste particularly think... good as well, like indoctrination. I think the crowning point for me was seeing a laxious, uh going on about philosophical atheists needing to get off the fence. Yes. Um, yes, oh, that's something I was accused of recently. Right, that yeah, philosophical yeah, atheists that. sit it, on the it, fence. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it's self, there's a self-awareness issue when you're sitting on the fence and you're telling other people um, that aren't on the fence and clearly aren't on the fence to get off the fence. And, you know, that's and I think that's, that's, you know, getting back to what Gary said about lenses, and, and that was a good metaphor, but there's, there's an element of self-awareness, you know, like you don't realize where the fence is, you don't realize what side of the fence you're on, you don't realize any of these things, but here you are telling other people to get off the fence when um, they're, they're, they're clearly not on the fence. Yeah. <laughs> and... Here's one to bring up as well. Social media can become its own form of indoctrination. You start beginning to exist in these echo chambers. You start to begin to get the rush of the like and the retweet. And it makes you say certain things and makes you want to adopt certain stances and makes you want to be viewed by your the group that you want to be seen as. You know, like wearing the right band t-shirt. You know, you want to be seen by these people. So that in it, in and of itself enforces a kind of subtle indoctrination. It is. I mean, it, it ties back into the whole tribalism thing. And the exact tweet that you were talking about, Dave, uh, it recently is 
Fuck philosophy atheist. Mute, mute, mute. The most annoying people. It's like they can't betwe- decide between atheism and religion, so they ride the fence. Go cry on someone else's tweets about your philosophical definitions. Tell McRae he'll want to cry with you. Right? <laughs> right. This This is from someone who only sees atheism as a lack of belief, right? And we did mention at the beginning there are different definitions for atheism. Now... What we would say on uh, for us, and I'm not telling you you have to accept our definitions, is you have a theist that believes at least one god exists, right? You have an atheist that believes no gods exist, like all three of us. And you have someone that uh, doesn't accept either proposition of theism or atheism, that gods exist or no gods exist. They're, they're unsure, right? They sit in the middle, they're on the fence, they just lack belief, right? And that is what a lot of people will call um, uh, atheism today. And, and, and we'll, we'll differentiate them from us by calling them lactheists. We won't, it's not seen as a derogatory term to us, but it's seen by lactheists as a derogatory term. Um, but ni- neither here nor there. Now, this person who is a lactheist, who sits on the fence because they don't hold a positive belief gods don't exist, is claiming that we, who hold the belief gods don't exist, is sitting on the fence and that they are not. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, <Yeah>. what? <laughs> and there's someone who has quite a big following and we, we we tend not to name and shame in general, although sometimes we do when they've got a massive, massive following. This is the sort of person that claimed that we're not worth listening to because we don't have a massive following. And it's like, right, yeah, the Kardashians have a massive following, love, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, tell me tell me who your favorite band is, and I'll tell you the Spice Girls tell full more albums. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, that sort of thing's frustrating. Uh, Gary also says, um, what is a better word than indoctrination? It's a real problem, especially in the red states like my home, Oklahoma. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so that's that's interesting. Um, because it it depends on a case-by-case, case, right? There might be people who are genuinely indoctrinated. Um, so it depends. What do you guys think? <coughs> I think Oklahoma is absolutely terrible. I agree with Gary on that. <laughs> and I say that coming from Tennessee, which, um, isn't as, as dusty as Oklahoma, but, um, holy shit, we got our red state warriors here. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's that's one of the things though. Like um I, it does depend think... on what what the person's done. So um I think there's a difference between someone who has reached a position and will no longer question it than someone who has been indoctrinated into that position. And I think the 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 best thing the best approach is is don't blame indoctrination for your bad arguments and bad approach. If you're not reaching people who are listening to you, the culprit is probably not indoctrination. In most cases, it's bad arguments, bad approach. Yeah, and you know what? Less so than the bad arguments, I think bad approach and and a lack of respect is definitely... um, the the main things that happens right um I, i've said this a number of times before i i could have a particular belief right and if some random person on the internet turned around and went you're a fucking idiot why why do you believe that you're so stupid i'd, I'd say hey mom <laughs> yeah i was gonna say my parents have been telling me that for like 50 years so it's all <laughs> yeah. water off a duck's back well, now. i mean it is for me but it would just turn me around to them and go well you're clearly like the people in my life who've said this sort of thing before and they were all wrong and you know what fuck you um 
But if it was someone who had spent time having conversations with me, building a rapport with me, showing me that they're right in a number of different situations, and then they said that, I might listen, right? Because they can have that approach with me because they've spent the time getting to that point. But they spent the, all the time before getting to that point. If they turn around to me and about something I was saying, goes, Joe, you're you're a bit of an idiot about this. What? Why the fuck are you thinking it? I would instantly go, okay, Dave is telling me that I need to rethink my position because I have the rapport with Dave, right? We've had these uh, so many different conversations about so many different things that I know Dave is usually right. So if Dave is turning around and saying, I'm wrong, that's a time I need to reconsider my position. But he spent the time calmly talking to me and building up a number of different positions, which led me to go, oh, okay, I understand why you think this and why you think that. And actually, I agree with you in all of these things, and I was wrong about this and that. So what you're saying about approach, completely agree. You know, if, <clears throat> I mean, Craig's just dropped into the chat. Craig, how are you doing? I mean, I, I'm i not someone that's going to turn around and try and convince Craig to stop being a Christian. I, I mean, I, Craig's a great guy. I don't care that he's a Christian, right? But if I did so want to convince him that he should drop his beliefs, well, Craig and I have been building a rapport online over the last, six months or so maybe longer having lots of fun conversations with each other discussing movies um, we've watched each other's videos we've name dropped each other in each other's videos and do you know what there's more chance that craig will listen to me if he has a, an opinion then i think actually that's quite harmful and i'll say craig can we discuss this there's a bigger chance that he'll listen to me than some other random atheist but more than that do you know what? If there's someone who holds the same beliefs as him, then there's even more chance that, that he'll listen to them. Just in the same way that, that I would listen to these guys above folks I don't know. And that's that's a big part of the approach. Like a big part of the approach is you've got to build the rapport. You've got to build a relationship. You've got to have some form of, of relationship there that, that is almost like a friendship, if not an actual friendship. And you've got to have respect for each other. And that's the only way that, if you so wish, you can start changing a mind. But you've also got to consider why you want to change a mind. Because most people who believe in a god, one, haven't been indoctrinated, and two, aren't doing any harm. Right? They're not. Yeah, and and again, you know, if you believe that everyone that believes in God is indoctrinated or insane or mentally ill or stupid or whatever, then then why are you talking to them? You know, why are you trying to to reach them? And um, you know, and of course, I've never, you know, ever felt that uh, people. There's way too many religious people for it to be uh, strictly a, a uh, function of insanity or mental illness or lack of information. And it always, like, I, I always come back to the giant squids. You know, why did those people believe in giant squids when science was telling them not? Because that was their evidence. That was their experience. Why did the scientists not believe in it? Because that was their training that was their evidence that was their experience and you know one of the things that always amazes me about laxism is the ability to have no opinion if god exists or not but have absolute certainty that no evidence for god exists so like you can be absolutely unsure and non-committal about god itself but you are damn sure that there's no evidence and and it, it's like they haven't thought that through real good. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think why that's... Is, you know, Sorry. and it's like Scooby Doo, right? You watch Scooby Doo, the old cartoon, and you know that that teaches us a lot of lessons. And um, and so here's these dumb people that they drive in this van up to, and they believe there's ghosts. 
Well, why do they believe in ghosts? Because that's their evidence and that's your experience. And here's the thing. Scooby-Doo and those games always believe in the ghosts too initially, but then they kind of sort through all the shit and they get to the end. <laughs> but, you know, they don't, they don't like yell at people and call them dumb. And, and for a little while, now you would think like, like after their 50th mystery or so, they'd be like, okay, we've been through this shit. It's going to be the old guy, you know, but no, initially they're scared. They're reacting to their experience that they're having. And it's the same thing. Are these people indoctrinated or dumb or insane? No, they, there's good evidence for them to think like they did at that time. And then here comes Fred, because it's always Fred, <laughs> ripping off the mask, right? Because he can't ever let anybody else have the glory. It's always got to be Fred with his fucking mascot, ripping off the mask and um, and going, you know, look, here is this guy. And everyone's like, oh, okay, well, now I don't believe in this monster. But there's a whole, it takes 30 minutes of animation to get to that point. <laughs> Fred doesn't just show these people a fucking meme and then drive out of town. <laughs> you know, they do the work. They they go through and investigate. There are no ghosts. <laughs> yeah. You're an idiot if you think there are. <laughs> yeah. We're out of here. Yeah, yeah no, no. So you, you can learn a lot from Scooby Doo, actually. Strangely enough, it was one of my favorite shows growing up. And I, I completely agree with everything you're saying about it. It's actually a more profound show than people give it credit for. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and Shaggy was soaked up the whole time. Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. Shaggy was my hero growing up and still kind of is. Yeah. I mean, that guy was on the weed so hard he's eating the dog tree. <laughs> That's some serious munchies there. That's proper munchies, yeah. See, my Anybody child, who my makes child... a 12 deck sandwich. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, that was legendary. It definitely was. But my, my childhood hero was um, Dave Lister and Super Mario. So, uh, yeah, a guy that eats a lot of curry and drinks a lot of beer and someone else that drink eats a lot of mushrooms. Um, <laughs> now we know why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, chicken and mushroom pot noodle always meant a very different thing to me when I was growing up. <laughs> So, uh, addressing the chat, um, sorry for getting behind with it. Honestly, Atheist says, I feel like Lactheus must have been created as a derogatory term. After all, their whole point is that they are the ones that should be called Atheists. So, just to clarify on how Lactheus came about. It was created by Ozymandias Ramses II in 2004, I think. Um... It might be later than that. I can't remember the specific date. And no, 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 it wasn't 2004. Gary Wolf came out in 2006 with the whole new atheism thing. Maybe, may, maybe it was 2014. It you doesn't mean, matter. You mean Aussie? It was yeah. about 2010. 2010, was it? Okay, cool. So whenever it was, 2010, I'll go with what Dave says. He's better at dates and time than I am. Um, <laughs> and the reason he came about it was because, obviously, he was uh, studying philosophy. He was on the path to his um, PhD in epistemology, which he never actually finished. But that's that's where he was going. And he started having interactions with people that were claiming that atheism is only a lack of belief in gods. And he was like, well, that's not how it is in philosophy. That's not how it's generally understood. Um and his general uh, split there was literally just, I want to tell the difference between an atheist like me that believes gods don't exist and an atheist that claims to only lack belief in gods. They don't want to be known as an agnostic. They want to be known as an atheist that lacks belief in gods. So if the A means lack instead of not as in negation, it makes sense to him that they are a lack theist rather than an atheist. So that was the way he addressed the topic. There wasn't the intention of it becoming a derogatory term. Now, there are certain people that did sort of push the whole derogatory term. 
And I sort of get it in the sense that there are specific black theists that have demonstrated consistent negative behaviors and poor understanding of logic and the burden of proof and, you know, just meme, 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 meme. And you meet that particular type of lack theist and you're like, oh, lack theists. And that's how it's become a derogatory term. But in and of itself, siloed isn't, you know, that there's the context there. You know, if you're an atheist that only lacks belief in gods, okay, you're a lack theist. If you're a lack theist that happens to have all these negative behaviors, ugh, lack theist. And it's the context, it's it's the way you're being addressed that it's act- probably like the word evangelical. Yeah. You know, where where is it wrong to be evangelical? No. But here it's gonna have a lot of negative connotation with people if you say Dave is evangelical, that, you know, people are probably like, well, I need to stay away from Dave then. You know, that's, that can be the case. It's not bad in of itself. It's just a word that, because of behavior, has kind of adopted a, a bad connotation. Yeah. Most people should avoid me because I'll try and get you to buy drugs for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so honestly, atheist also says um, indoctrinated is already a nicer way of saying brainwashed, and I think that's that's something you need to to address. There's the difference between you know just being taught something and actually being brainwashed. I'd say indoctrination is definitely closer to brainwashing. Um, and I don't think brainwashing is an actual scientific thing. I, I mean, I don't know. I've never really looked into it, but I, I, I imagine that there is the certain, well, <laughs> indoctrination so someone appears brainwashed, um, like we were talking about earlier with sleeper agents and things like that that can be, hey, you think about things like hypnosis and all of those techniques that can make people act outside of themselves. Um, although a lot of hypno- hypnotists will say they can't actually make you do anything you don't want to do already. But then I say, well, can't you make someone want to want something? <laughs> um, apparently, Craig has seen some great definition of atheist debates on Twitch recently. I don't believe you, Craig. I don't believe there's such a thing as a great definition of atheist debate. There is no way... It's a good definition. <laughs> oh, in fact, honestly, atheist says the same thing. I feel like there cannot be great debates of the definition of atheism. By definition, uh, it's just shit all the way down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd agree with you there. <laughs> um, Craig, yes... Rev has destroyed us. He completely destroys us every time we uh, have a conversation with him. <laughs> I brought out giant squid and Scooby Doo. <laughs> um. So Craig also says building rapport is the uh, most important part for sure. I've even talked about this on my la- uh, on one of my last videos. And I I, I I think it is. I think that's the thing. Like if if it's something that that we meme dropping atheists and the like and and our quote te- quote tweeting atheists if you're actually trying to change your mind then these things are things you shouldn't do and if you're just looking for pats on the back or to point out how stupid someone is to inflate your own ego you're just a bully and you're a bit of an idiot as well you know but you're just a bully. I feel attacked. <laughs> if the only technique you have is quote tweeting to rally the troops, um, then honestly, I'm atheist girl. Um, you're a fucking idiot, and uh, you you. And if you really care more about the number of followers you have than the content you put out, I'm atheist girl. You should really just. You know, get a fucking life. (laughs) I honestly. um, Sorry. Uh, 
little bit of repressed anger coming out there. <laughs> um, but I'm conversation... always amazed at how many likes and how many comments they get. Those those kinds of posts because they'll they'll post something like, "Hey, what's worse, you know, stomach cancer or reading the Bible?" And then there'll be like forty thousand re- you know replies. Well, stomach uh, reading the Bible is is worse than stomach cancer because it's terrible, you know. And and you read through these things and you're just like, eh, you know, I mean, really, is it? You know, is 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 a book that bad? Is is you know, you have the ability to read a book and then not believe it, right? Or is is belief in theism really as bad as you're creating it out to be? But I'm always amazed at how many people just, in fact, I started um, looking at a lot of those accounts that were posting, and I think they were kind of clickbaity posts, you know, they're trying to just get people, but the people that were liking and stuff, I was like, yeah, it's a guy I probably don't need to follow anymore. Yeah. It kind of weed out the, the you know, the, a little bit that way. Yeah, I I genuinely don't like those kind of posts. I mean, to be honest, like we've experimented with it on Answers and Reason before a few times where we've written um, clickbaity titles to our articles. Um, and it works. It really works, yeah. right? To at least build the engagement of people responding to the message that goes out on social media. Not many people will actually read the article. Right. And you can right. tell that from their response, because if they'd read the first line of the article, it contradicts what the title says and explains it in more detail. But they're not interested in that. But the fact that they have responded, because more people have responded, more people see the article and therefore more people will cl- click the link so your percentage of clicks might be lower than normal but your number of clicks will be much higher and you'll get more followers that way as well so drama and clickbait and all of that if your main concern is getting followers then that's that's what you're going to do you know, if your main concern is substance, then you're fucked, basically. <laughs> if I wanted followers, I would have been born Jesus. <laughs> uh, most definitely. So, folks, uh, are there any more questions that you have out there in uh in in chat room land and and folks is there anything else that you wanted to address tonight and the only thing i can think of about wanting to address now is to congratulate rev again yes most definitely rev congratulations uh you i, think... I got married oh. today yeah i know that's I fucking awesome that. I, I says, know. Oh, sorry, yeah. my condolences. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, have you engaged enough skepticism to actually check the evidence that you're actually married? Because that's well, the only this, important question. <laughs> do you have point, physical I, evidence? <laughs> yeah, I do. If, if, if you would see my lady friend, you'd be like, yeah, don't question it. Don't be skeptical. Yeah, I'll kick your coverage. <laughs> Just go with it. Uh, yeah, yeah I, can, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing I did want to address, uh, actually, and one of the things whilst we were, were planning on having this um, episode was something that came out in um, the Answers in Reason debate group on Facebook. And uh, one of the people that, that posted there, um, a good friend, he, he uh, operates off the chain atheists and um, he lives in a, a very, very dogmatically religious fundamentalist area. And he posted something um, about how all religious people were, were too cr- credulous. And... The reason I want to bring this up, actually, is because of the way he, he, he dealt with something. So he was having a conversation with someone, and then he tagged me in to try and address things. And he thought 
that I was going to be 100% on his side because I'm an atheist too. And what I actually addressed was flaws in... There were, there were probably, uh, from what I was reading at the start, more flaws in what he was saying, but a few flaws in the theist as well. And I addressed it and I gave it an all-round perspective. And what I will say for, for this guy, it was a great degree of skepticism on his part because he turned around and went, okay, fair, you've made me actually reconsider what I was thinking here because I was explaining that, you know what, growing up, we're all too credulous. Um, and throughout our lives, there's so many things that we're credulous of. Look at us atheists and how we tend to react to posts from Aaron Ra and Matt Dillahunty and, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins and all of that. We, we tend to just accept it straight away, even if it's not a topic that they're specialized in. So being credulous isn't limited to theists. It's something that is just built into all of us humans it comes back to the whole tribalism thing that we were talking about it comes back to the indoctrination thing and yes it took him having a conversation with a fellow atheist to turn around and reconsider his position and i pointed out that you know his experience of theists happens to be the the texan style theists you know he so you understand why he thinks what he does, but that's not the only theists that are out there in the world. And a theist like the particular one he was discussing with is not the same sort of theist. But this comes back to what we were talking about as well, about building that rapport. I've built a rapport with this person having the odd conversation over the last couple of years. Is someone that has some respect for my opinion. So me turning around and going, well, you haven't got the whole picture there, made him reconsider his position. But the theist who said the same thing didn't have that same... Hmm. And this is what I'm talking about, about the conversations that we have with theists or other atheists or anything like that. Going out there and having these arguments with them Generally, it's not going to go anywhere because we haven't spent the time building the rapport and having that respect for each other to actually say, well, yeah, you know what? This is where you're going wrong. This is what I agree with. Da, 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 da. And having them turn around and go, okay, yeah, I'll reconsider my. Um, so, uh, off the chain atheists, good group, good Twitter account, check them out. Um, and definitely. One of the few atheists, uh, Tom, that will change his mind, presented new evidence. But like we mentioned, it has to be from the right source. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, it looks like there's no uh, new questions coming through the chat other than saying that we should um legalize scooby snacks so i i'm with you <laughs> let's do it <laughs> um rev though thank you so much for taking the time to be here especially on your yeah, wedding day cheers, mate. i mean god oh. you know That's philip dedicated. wouldn't even be here on his birthday but you on your wedding day you're here <laughs> <laughs> Weddings aren't as important as birthdays. <laughs> the fact that you managed to survive another year is a pretty big issue. <laughs> Not when you're as young as Philip, you know, like at your age, yeah, of course, Dave. Um... <laughs> yeah, 90 is getting a bit old now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, honestly, I've had such a fun time tonight and um, it's great to have all of you in the chat that, that we have here, um, you know, putting through your thoughts. And uh, I'm sorry if I haven't addressed every single one of them, um, but if you don't tag me. Yes, Craig. Yes, it was uh, Rev's wedding today. He got married today. Yeah, there you go. You missed it at the beginning. He also had crepes today. I'm not sure which is the, the, the bigger achievement. Um, <laughs> he also managed to stay awake and come on this stream. There you go. <laughs> I mean, if it's you're a Muslim or Mormon, getting married 
getting crepes is probably a bigger deal than getting married. <laughs> I don't get crepes every day. No. <laughs> Craig says congratulations there, Rev. Um, so awesome. <laughs> right, guys, is there anything else that you want to cover off completely unrelated tonight? Doesn't matter. Um, you know, anything you want to shill? Yeah, I farted. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm very drunk now. You, you can't tell it because I'm very good at covering it up. You know? <laughs> well, it's just because you're really blurry. <laughs> And you know, just talk a lot of nonsense like most drunk people. <laughs> but that's standard life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what being a philosopher is all about. Uh, Giant squids and Scooby Doo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So thank you, everybody that joins us, especially uh, Gary. Thank you for joining us for the first time tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, it was great to have you here. Uh, loved your metaphor. Um, I'll be looking at you through a different lens. Uh, incidentally, that was the name of our first season of Fresh Air. Uh <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> Takes me back. <laughs> that was that was a long time ago. I mean, that's only available on like Spotify and the website. That's not even on the YouTube. So yeah. Uh, but guys, thank you, every single one of you, uh, especially Rev as well. Um, I always love you being on here, and hopefully you can join us again soon. Anytime you've got anything yeah, you want to discuss, yeah. let us know because we absolutely love you having here. You're such a great guy. Thanks. So uh, please do. So you've been watching um, the the uh, what's it called? Oh, the Sci-Fi Show. And uh, I'm a Joe. bunch of cunts, <laughs> and I'm Dave, apparently. <laughs> and Stacy, sorry, just before we end, Stacy has turned around and said, uh, "I missed the stream, but wanted to say congrats to Rev." Thank you very much, Stacy. And uh, Kimo says, "Now that I've been fully indoctrinated, I'll give some sincere thank you to everyone for the stream." <laughs> Is that the wife? Hello. Come Hold here. On, Say congratulations to us. Yeah. Come here. Hey, she's quite hot. <laughs> hey, congratulations. congratulations. So, you mean to be skeptical anymore? No, definitely no, not. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great yeah, to meet you well done you're definitely punching rev <laughs> thank you punching about my weight <laughs> i can relate to that yeah it's a good feeling that's awesome. what happens when you're smart you're, you're <laughs> right. your weight class or, or you have a glorious right. bid <laughs> see people discount the whole sense of humor will get you everywhere but see it's yeah, true. It, it definitely does. <laughs> Red is evidence. <laughs> awesome. Right, guys, thank you very much. Um, and I, I would suggest everyone check out uh, a number of streams we've done recently, especially on uh, severance and skepticism. Thank you very much, everybody, and have yourselves a fantastic night. And also don't forget to check out Rev's 10 questions because it's one of the funniest videos you'll ever watch. And Absolutely. one of the most profound. <laughs>